Interwebs, welcome to Let's Fix Computers. Uh, I've got a HP Pavilion 14 CE here that does not post. So uh, I'll just switch it on so we can see where we're up to. I've been having a little sneaky look at this just to check what I was getting into, just because if it had been a matter of just unplug the battery and plug it back in again, I probably wouldn't have bothered with a video there. But anyway, we turn this thing on, we've got a solid power on light, we've got fan noise. However, we've got this flash code out of it here. So let's wait for that to go around again. We've got one, two, one, three, one, two. We had three long flashes and two short flashes. So that's a BIOS code from a HP laptop. Um, and if we Google search, um, the way I usually find out what these are is I searched HP Pavilion 14 three long, two short. Um, and a uh, HP forums result tells me that that one is a memory error. And generally speaking, if you're getting if you're getting flash codes out of a um, out of a HP laptop, it's probably going to be a, a memory error or a motherboard error. Um, and generally speaking, my procedure for how I approach these issues is the same regardless of what I'm getting, because you know bad memory might trigger all kinds of weird errors. So you kind of got to test it anyway. Um, so yeah, you have to be careful when you're look, when you're reading postcodes and stuff like that. You have to be careful how you interpret them, because they can certainly give an indication on where the problem is likely to be. You shouldn't take them as verbatim because they can really lead you up the garden path. So take them with caution. At any rate, it appears that we've got a memory error with this. So I've already had the back cover off of this. So I'll just show that. Let's just pull back slightly. Uh, I'm just hanging the display off the back so I can very easily flip it over and try and turn it on again. So we've got three screws along the front and two hidden under the feet for these laptops. So I'll just take that cover back off again. And that gets us this far. So the first thing you're going to want to do if you're dealing with this is just take the screws out from around the battery and disconnect the battery and just leave the laptop for a couple of three minutes, you know, uh, two minutes, five minutes, you know, it doesn't need to be very long. Um, these HP pavilions do not have CMOS batteries in them, RTC batteries. So taking the battery out and disconnecting the charger also functions as a BIOS reset. So I'm just going to leave that for a minute or so. This has probably been long enough while I waffle. And now I'm just going to plug it in and I'm going to try it again. So uh, with the battery disconnected, I'll just plug in the charger. And let's just try that another spin. Power light. And uh, it's already giving that memory flash. So still no result there. Three long, two short. Fine. Okay, so let's try giving it different memory. So I'll pop out that memory module and I'll put in this known good. So this is DDR4 that's going in. Stick that guy in there. And once again, we'll just try it again, see if that does anything for us. Charger in, power button, power light. Three long, two short. Same deal. Exactly the same issue. So the fact that it's just giving me memory errors just straight away with different memory in it immediately leads me to believe that this is a motherboard fault, not a memory fault. And <clears throat> this immediately illustrates my point about being careful about how you interpret um, flash codes and other BIOS messages. See, in this instance, it's telling me that there is a memory error, but we have a known good module in there. So it's not so much that it's saying your memory is faulty, it's saying that it's unable to detect the memory. So why is it unable to detect the memory? Well, there is clearly a fault with the motherboard in this laptop. So what can we do about that? Well, we've already, um, we've already changed the memory. We've already tried to reset the BIOS. And on modern laptops like this HP, you very quickly run out of things you can do with this. Um, so just like almost immediately, that leads us into some kind of physical connection issue on the motherboard or a BIOS problem. 
Now, the interesting thing is when you Google search that error code, the error code actually means, and I quote, um, the EC, the embedded controller, timed out waiting for the BIOS to detect the memory. So this could very easily be a BIOS fault because it's the BIOS's job to check the memory. And the, in the EC, the embedded controller, that's this ITE chip over here, the, I, the EC is waiting for BIOS to respond and say, yeah, we're good to go, all system power on kind of thing. And it's not getting a reply. So uh, my next guess is that the BIOS is gone on this. So we're going to start approaching that. Uh, now, at the same time, we should be looking for any other obvious faults here. You know, we should look for, you know, uh, we should look for contact issues on the memory slot, you know, like wires hanging out, uh, dust in the contacts. We should look for any burned components nearby. Um, and I've kind of had the, a quick look over this and not seen anything. So I'm going to advance directly to um, BIOS programming with this one. Uh, so I'll take the, the motherboard out and then we'll have a look at the motherboard and we'll go over how we start approaching that. You guys have seen me doing BIOS stuff on this channel several times now. I'm doing it more and more recently because I think this laptop will be a very prime example on why being able to solve BIOS issues on a laptop is, as far as I'm concerned, becoming mandatory for any repair shop. This is stuff that you're going to encounter often, and if you're running a computer repair shop, you need to be learning how to do this. That's, that's my two pence. Because this is stuff that I've been learning recently, and I'm the more that the more that I learn, the more that I seem to encounter the stuff that I'm learning. Whereas previously, at this point, I'd just be saying to the customer, "I don't know. I guess the motherboard's dead. We've got to find a new motherboard for it." And then you start hitting up eBay and you're searching for new motherboards. This might be very easy. Let's take the motherboard out. Right, our motherboard is out, and uh, as you can see, it is a G7A-2G, or the number that I would be searching for if I was looking for schematics is this one here, DAO G7AMB6D1. Uh, that's probably the number that will find you schematics, um, in my experience. However, probably won't need those today. So, we want to find the BIOS chip. So. There are a couple of package types we should look out for and a couple of locations where we're likely to find it. Um, so we've got stuff all the way over here, but this is, you know, IO, wireless, um, uh, battery input, stuff like that. All the action is going on at this end of the board. So our BIOS chip is going to be near to the EC, the CPU, the PCH, that kind of thing. So we've got our EC here. Um, our uh, our CPU is here, and it has an integrated um, uh, PCH on it, which is not visible, but these long rectangular boys are generally going to have an integrated PCH. And that leaves our BIOS chip being this dude here. So the indicators that make this the BIOS chip are, it's got a square box around it, so it's, it's highlighted as here is the important chip kind of thing. But also, as you can see, in this case, we've got a SOP8, S-O-P-8 package. Um, you, we, the two types that we'll commonly see are this one, the SOP8, or you'll see something that is a WSON8, which looks very similar to these guys up here, where you have a flat package with eight legs on it. And the reason why I know it's this one and not any of these is because... These guys are all power related. You can see that these are MOSFETs that are sitting on big power traces. So this is all power stuff. It's not going to be your BIOS chip. This guy is sitting right between all the important components and very clearly only has data lines going to it, not big fat power traces. Same goes for these guys here. If we take a closer look, 
at the other SOP8 packages that are very close by. You can see again, these dudes here, they've got big fat power traces going to them that are connecting up to inductors and stuff like that. So that's how I know that it's not going to be these guys. Whereas this guy, again, it's just all data going to it. Except for that VCC, that's fairly large, that power pin, but whatever. Anyway, and finally, when you think you've got a suspect, we can just have a look at what the code on the chip is. And the giveaway for a modern BIOS chip is it's going to be 25 series SPI. And whatever the brand of chip is, the model number is probably going to start with 25, a letter, then the size. So we've got 25 series B, 64 megabit. So that immediately is the smoking gun that this is our BIOS chip. Now, it's also fairly common to have laptops, especially HPs, have more than one BIOS chip. In a recent video I did on a Samsung, we had two BIOS chips and the actual full BIOS image was spanned across two of them. Um, now, there are various implementations of BIOS uh, that involve spanning. Uh, some of them might be spanned, some of them might have the BIOS on one and the uh, EC on the other. There are lots of different ways of doing it, uh, and it is too varied and broad a question to say when it will be and won't be. Um, so on any given motherboard, to be honest, unless I'd seen it before, I wouldn't be able to tell you. You've just got to look at the contents of the chips and find out. Um, so while I'm here, I want to know if there are is a second BIOS chip anywhere. So we've got this guy here. What else have we got? And the answer to that is not a whole lot, if I'm honest. There are no other chips on here which I could identify as a BIOS chip. There's no other SOP8 chips. And if one of them is a SOP8, the other one is probably going to be as well. Um, so not seeing anything there. If we turn the board over, there's almost nothing going on on the back of this board. It's just all passives. There's a couple of small dudes, a couple of small dudes, a couple of these guys. Uh, that looks like a PWM chip, but there's nothing here that looks anything like a BIOS chip. So it looks like we have just a single BIOS chip solution for this motherboard, and that makes it quite an easy one to deal with. The Samsung was quite an adventure because we had to deal with two chips, and we had to break down and rebuild our image and so on. So, good. So the first thing that we're going to do then is we need to get a dump of what is currently on this BIOS chip. We need to back it up before we do anything with it. There are two ways that we can interface with this. Um, we can desolder it from the motherboard uh, and put it in directly into a reader, or we can attempt to use a clip or some other kind of in-circuit flashing. Now, I keep getting people asking me to demonstrate clips and in-circuit flashing, and the long and the short of it is, Every time I make inquiries about it, every time I talk to experts about it, they all say the same thing. Don't. Just take the chip off the board. In-circuit flashing is absolutely doable, but there are there is a laundry list of caveats about it. Uh, you need to know a lot about the kind of platform that you're working with because the problem is we don't if we put a clip on this, so we're we're um we're intersecting into these data lines and power lines, we don't know what else is on those data lines and power lines. And on some devices, there's not a lot. And you you know, the BIOS chip is more or less the only one home there. But there are other laptops where some of those data or power lines could be going to the EC, they could be going to the PCH, they could be going to other CMOS stuff that is very delicate and very easy to damage if you are incorrectly using a clip. So for that reason, the more I've learned about in-circuit flashing, the more I've understood that the general rule of thumb is don't, in short. Now, there's going to be people in the comments that will say, oh, I do in-circuit flashing all the time. And it's absolutely fine. That's cool. However, I'm sure you know an awful lot about the platforms and you know all of those little tri tricks and tips. And if you guys reckon it's possible to make a generalized approach on this, by all means, I'm open to suggestions. However, in my opinion, just taking the chip off the board is an awful lot easier than learning all the ins and outs of who else is on that bus. So for that reason, I'm going to put my heatproof mat down and I'm going to switch on my hot air station. 
Now, um, hot air stations, I appreciate that a lot of people want to do in circuit flashing because they don't have a hot air station. But if you're getting into this level of repair where you're doing BIOS repairs and stuff like that, really ought to be learning to solder as well. And BIOS chips like this, they're really easy to handle. So again, I know I keep saying you ought to learn this, you should be doing this, but I say that because as someone who is running a computer shop, I'm not learning this out of a passion per se. I'm learning this because this is what I need to do professionally. You know, I've come to the conclusion that this is what it takes to get with the times. So I'm learning to solder. I'm learning to fix BIOSes. And that's that's the goal here. So get yourselves a hot air station. You turn it on and you put it to... You know what? Uh, I've also had people bashing me for using 450. So I'm going to run 400 degrees maximum airflow. And we're going to take this guy off the board. So I'm going to angle the airstream so we're going in that direction. So we're not heating up the CPU or this memory module slot. And I'll tell you what, as a special treat, we'll put some flux on there as well, just to help go easy on those solder joints. Put a bit of flux there, and a bit of flux there. There we go. Just melt that, get it flowing. And we're just gonna put some heat around the general vicinity, just so we don't thermally shock the board. And here we go. And just like that, it's off. Now we've got to put this into a programmer so we can read it. And today I'm going to use my RT809F because it's the one that I have on the bench. However, if you want a cheap access into doing your flashing, uh, I've also got videos on, oh, where's my, there it is. I've also got videos on using this uh, CH341A mini programmer. Uh, this one's the V1.6, they're on like V1.7 or V1.8 now. But the modern versions of these with the voltage selector switch, these are really cheap. It's like 20 to 30 pounds or 20 to 30 dollars once you've got it and paid for shipping and stuff like that. But this is a really cheap way to start programming BIOS chips. Search my channel for CH341A and look for the more recent one. Um, I recommend against buying the older model with the black PCB because you need to do volt mods on that to really make it usable. At any rate, I'm going to use the 809F because this is the one that is on my bench and plugged into the PC already. So I've got a 200mm SOP8 socket adapter um, plugged into this guy at the moment. And this guy is a bit hit and miss. Um, sometimes you've got to clean up the legs of the chip properly or give it a wiggle to make it work. Um, however, one of the things I really like about the 809F is it tells you when you've got a bad connection to the chip. So if you're having problems with this socket, it will tell me that the socket is the problem. And in which case, I can either just jiggle the chip in the socket, or in the worst case scenario, I'll just solder it into an adapter. But I've been having good luck with this thing recently, so I'm going to use it today. Let's start up the software. So this chip is a 25B64C SIG. Let's do a smart ID. 25... No, nope, didn't get a great reading from that, so let's do 25B64. C SOP8200, that'll do me. Okay. All right, and let's go for a read. And let's make ourselves a dump. And I shall call this HP14CE. And there's our raw chip dump. It's super important to save the f just save the contents of the chip and just save that as a backup file and don't touch it. If we do any modifications at all, we're going to copy that file and then work on the copy. So if we make a complete hash up of things, the worst case scenario is we can just reprogram this chip with the original file that we pulled off of it, put everything back to how it was before. So now we've got a dump of the BIOS that's already on there. We need a known good BIOS. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to head up the HP website and download the latest BIOS update for this laptop directly from HP. And we're going to program that to this. There's going to be more to this job than that. Even if that works, in all probability, we'll need to do some modifications to that BIOS. But my first priority is just simply to try and make the laptop turn on. If we get that far, we know it's worth spending the effort doing all of the rest of the modification work to it as well. So let's go to the HP website. And we've got a CE0523. And let's go all drivers, BIOS... System BIOS update. Okay, let's download that. So this is downloading a .exe file. So the next thing we need to do is we need to try and extract the binary BIOS file out of this .exe. For some manufacturers, this is very straightforward, and for some it's very difficult. HP are a bit hit and miss. If we're lucky, this file will actually have a specific extraction tool for me. So I'm just going to go through this. Let's do next. Excellent. So this is one of the BIOS update utilities that's going to allow me to extract the image. So as you can see, we can update the system BIOS on this device. It's not going to be this device because this is my desktop PC. We can create a recovery USB flash drive that, we, that, that can be used on devices with a corrupted BIOS. Or we can copy the BIOS image in order to use it on other devices. That's what we're going to do. That middle option is very interesting. I'm suddenly thinking I might want to try that out. Um, I w wish I'd thought of this before I started recording this video. Although, I'm not sure if we'd have had much luck considering we're stuck on memory detection. Hmm. Um, we might come back to this. I'll see how far I get. Right, so as you can see, um, we can't update this one, but we can make a flash drive or we can just copy the BIOS image file to any location for advanced users. If we had a Dell uh, laptop in on the bench at the moment, we would run the EXE in the same way that I've done here, and we would probably immediately go to a message saying, this is not a Dell computer. Uh, and what you do is you leave that message on the screen, and then you go into your temporary folder. So if I just do Windows Run and type in uh, percentage temp percentage, this opens up my local temporary files. And what you would find in here is that the uh, the name of the Dell BIOS update will appear as a folder in here. So it's not going to be here right now because I'm not running it. But we would spot a folder that has the same name as the Dell BIOS EXE file. And if you go into there, that's where your binary file will be. And there are other ones where you have to do a command line to extract it from the Dell.exe. And if you've got another brand like Lenovo, there are other ways. And for Samsung, there's other ways. And... It's very difficult to make a concise video that covers everything. But again, the purpose of this video is to show you how to approach the issue so you understand what you're trying to achieve. And the specifics, you can go to support discords, support forums, and say to people, hey, I've got a Lenovo XYZ. Any idea how I can extract the BIOS for it? And hopefully some helpful people can help you out. So let's copy our BIOS image to another location. Next. Right, BIOS files will be saved to this folder. So I'm going to put that in my dumps folder. HP14CE. Copying files. Now there's two files here. A 16 megabyte file and an 8 megabyte file. That 16 megabyte file concerns me because I'm not sure what that's for. It could be the EC firmware, but I wouldn't expect that to be 16 megabytes. Okay, well, there's an easy way to solve this one. What I'm going to do is I'm going to open the BIOS dump I did uh, and see if that is a complete BIOS image. So the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to use UEFI tool and I shall open the BIOS image in UEFI tool and see if it opens, basically. So let's open an image file, go to our dumps folder and let's open our dump file. And in there we've got a full Intel image, complete with ME and BIOS regions. So, yeah, that's a complete BIOS. I'm guessing that second one must be for the EC. Uh, it could be for Thunderbolt. Um, it could be various other things. So, I'm surprised it's 16 megabytes, but someone in the comments might be able to answer that one. They might go, oh, that'll be XYZ. But the main BIOS file is the one that I'm interested in. So, I'm going to work with that. 
We'll go back to my RT809F programming and we're going to open that fresh file we've got. 14CE. And we want the 8 megabyte file because that matches the 8 megabyte chip that we dumped. Open. All right. And we're now just going to go ahead and write. So we've got a backup of the original ROM. So if this all goes sideways or makes things worse, we can just restore back to the original again. Flashing is complete, so let's drop our chip out the reader and put it back on the motherboard. Now, something that I forgot to mention before taking it off um, is um, when you are removing BIOS chips, it's really, really easy to knock components sideways. Ask me how I know. Uh, so make sure, I strongly recommend, if you're not videoing, take a picture. I know it sounds really pedantic, but take a heckin' picture of the area so you can see if you've knocked loose any of these little capacitors or resistors nearby. Because if you knock them loose or blow them away with the hot air or something like that, it's so easy to just not notice. So, yeah, it's a thing. Right, I'm going to put some fresh uh, flux down on there. And we're just going to retin those pads with some, with some fresh solder. And that makes sure that we get a nice, good reflow. It's quite likely that the chip is going to come off the board a second time. However, we're going to try and keep these pads in really nice condition just so we get good, reliable solder joins on them. So we'll just flow some nice leaded solder on there. And again, just being careful of those dudes there. There we go. Nice shiny pillows. Except there. Please don't bridge. There we go. I'm going to position that guy in there. Yeah. Again, we've got a dot in the bottom right. And now I'm going to bring down the airflow on my hot air. I've gone down to about 50% air now, just so we don't uh, blow everything sideways. And I'm just going to keep this guy in place while we heat up. This is the time where you're in big danger of knocking things sideways because you're constantly trying to get the chip to sit straight. There we go, that solder's more molten, I think. Whoops. Come back, Liz. Can you be a little bit straighter? Oh my word. Oh, I've, I've made a hash of it. I've done everything wrong. All right, there, that's it. <laughs> really? Come on. Please go straight. Eh. Eh. Ah, that's good enough. There's no bridges. Everything is soldered down. That'll do for me. I don't want to stay in there with the hot air for too long. The longer you're in there, the more likely you are to break something. As things stand, I can touch the CPU quite happily. And remember, if you can touch it with your bare fingers, it's probably less than 50 degrees because around about the high 40s, 50 to C, that's the point where it'll actually burn your finger to the touch. So uh, that's always a good indicator as to how hot something is in the moment. If you can keep your hand on there without burning yourself, it's probably below 50. Right, let's put this back in the case so we can wire it back in and let's see if anything has changed. Right, how much of this do I care about? Uh, we'll have a keyboard, because then we can get indicator LEDs. I'll plug in this I.O. board. Um, there's nothing on it, but sometimes there are indicators, and sometimes motherboards get a bit snotty if I.O. boards aren't plugged in. Um, sometimes you can get I.O. boards down the front with indicator LEDs on it that you need to post, so be mindful of these things. I think that's about all I need. We do want a monitor, just so if it does actually start up, we can see a post screen. We want DC. It's all a bit scrunched up, this DC connector. I'm not a fan. And speaking of fans, we want a cooling fan. 
It's not going to overheat straight away. However, the cooling fan can tell you a lot about the status of the computer. You can you learn you know a lot about where the computer is up to based on what the fan is doing. So that's important. And one screw through that fan is just holding everything in place now. Uh, let's stick in let's stick in the original memory module. And that should be enough for us to uh, give it a spin. I'm going to open it up with my fingers near the hinges so we don't rip anything open while the case is off. Charger plugged in. We have a light at the charger. Power on. Power light. Uh, it's doing exactly the same thing. No change at all. Okay. That's very disappointing. Alright. So, BIOS was not the answer. So, the next thing I'm going to try, and I haven't attempted this before, but I hear that the connections along the back of the... Um, the connections along the back of the memory connector are classics for becoming damaged. So I'm going to try reflowing these connections. As I say, I've not tried this before, but I've heard from people in the know that it is a thing that can happen. So let's just run the soldering iron along those and see if that does anything for me. There's no visual problems with them, as far as I'm concerned, but they are vulnerable to just pulling up off of the board from bend stresses and things like that. And there might be a bad connection there that we just can't see with the naked eye. Maybe a microscope could see it. Uh, am I going to use the big chisel for this? I think I will. So um, I'm going to put some flux along there. Oh, this is going to be a lot of flux. An entire pool of flux. If this works will flash the original BIOS back onto it because we've currently got a clean BIOS on there that's not going to have any serial numbers or anything like that. So if you're going, ah, you've got the wrong BIOS on there now, don't worry, I haven't forgotten. Let's just wait and see if we need to do something about that or not. <clears throat> so soldering iron tip is just coming up to temperature. That'll do. And here we go. So I'm just wiping back and forth just to reflow those joins. Avoiding uh, bridges where applicable. Oh, having issues with some bridges there. Let's clean the tip and go in again. There we go. Once again, cleaning the tip when we're starting to get bridging. I could be using a smaller tip for this, but I'm quite comfortable with the chisel. It's got a nice, cozy amount of thermal mass on it that just makes this very straightforward. Come on, out you come. Mr. Bridge. Mr. Bridge, please depart. Now, let's get a little bit more flux in there. There we go. Some extra flux just pulled that right out. And I'm going to turn the board around to do the other side. One last little bridge on the end there. There we go. Okay. 
let's give that a spin. So obviously we've left a lot of flux on the board. I'm aware of that as well, but like getting the board cleaned up is the least of my concern at the moment. We can clean it when it works. Put in the original memory module again. I might try swapping out the memory module in a mo if this one doesn't work, just because we have to consider the possibility that the memory module is also bad. So uh, just because, um, you know, if we find that it was a bad slot, it might also be a bad memory module. That is a thing that it could be. I'm just going to do a visual inspection there just to make sure I haven't left any bridges that I didn't spot. I think we're good. It's very easy to go cross-eyed doing this kind of thing. Especially because I'm a nub and work without a heckin' microscope. Light on the charger. Here we go. Power light. It hasn't gone straight into flashes this time. Okay, we had a momentary burst from the fan, and then it power cycled. Okay, that's another power cycle. Third time's the charm. No. Okay. Um, this is the fourth attempt. Oh! I was going to give up on three, and I was like, Dells sometimes need four. And I just, I was about to give up, and I said, I'm going to wait for number four. Woo! Happy days. All right, so that was throwing up some weird BIOS messages there, probably because we had a clean BIOS image on it. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to unplug it. Um, and we're going to flash the original BIOS image back onto it. It looks like that was it. It was bad contacts on the memory. See, uh, well, yeah. What I'm thinking at this point is I'm thinking, hmm, the previous attempts where it was starting to boot, it was going straight into those flashes. It did, Like that time, it clearly did RAM training. Previous times, it didn't look like it was doing RAM training. But then if it didn't have a connection to the memory module, of course it's not going to RAM train. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay. Um, I'm going to take a break first. Always remember to take breaks when you're working on stuff. Keep your head clear. Right. We win. However, we've got to restore that BIOS. So let's get the motherboard back out again. Bit of a bummer we went through the faff with the BIOS only to find that it wasn't the BIOS, but hey, that's how it be sometimes. Okay, so now we're just going to open our dump file. So there's the original bin that we had, and we're just going to write that back. How much do you want to bet that it's both? And I'm going to write this original BIOS back to the chip, and it's going to not work again. So on that note, I will give it another post test after doing this before we screw everything back into place. Right. Super scuff config, go. Just need to make sure it still works, then I can take the board out, clean all the flux off and reassemble it properly. <clears throat> so it might have a world-class hissy fit again because we've reflashed the BIOS. Got no charger light. I don't like that. You know, I think I've got a tiny bridge on the BIOS chip. Oh, you cheeky little bastard. More flux. More flux, call the people in the back. Yeah, actually needed more flux there.
Probably a bit too much solder on those pads, which is why we're struggling. That should do it. Right, what say you now? There we go, now we've got to charge a light. Ugh. Don't panic. Don't panic. Oh, everything's falling out because I didn't screw it in. Just show me the post screen. Uh, uh. Do something. I'm going to walk away and when I come back I expect to see a HP logo on that screen. There we go. No operating system found. That's good because there's no SSD in there. I'd be a bit worried if it booted to be honest. Cool. Power off. Good. Right, it's coming out for the last time. I've just got to wipe down all of these contacts of the flux residue. Because I'm not a dick. And... It's all going back together. There we go. CMOS checks I'm invalid. No problem. Enter to reboot. Right, I don't have the Windows password for this one, so this is actually as far as we're going today. Um, but we've got the laptop up and running, uh, which is mission objective achieved. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, interesting fix. Uh, we got some good information about doing BIOS repairs, but it wasn't the BIOS in the end. Uh, however, we did get a really good win with um, uh, resoldering the memory module slot. So good good victory that I'm very happy with and I look forward to trying that on future jobs as well. Uh, thank you very much as always my links for my discord and other support stuff is down in the description and I'll see you next and I will see you guys next time. Bye!